At NASA, we build satellites. You may know that. And down at NASA Ames Research Center, we build, uh, one of the things we specialize in is really low-cost satellites. Typical satellites today cost about half a billion or a billion dollars within NASA and, and similar sorts of costs within industry. And it's a lot to do with the fact that we're making very bespoke satellites. And what we mean by small satellites down at NASA Ames, uh, down near Mountain View, is anything that costs between 10 and 200 million dollars. And uh, for, for, for some years now, the, our director of engineering, Pete Klupa, used to, when we were in our meetings about, uh, about our small satellites, used to hold up this phone and say, hey, why are you making it so complicated? Everything that you need for a satellite is in a phone. And, and increasingly, that has become true. And so we tried to uh, set out to test his hypothesis. Can you use a phone in space? Can it be the core elements of a spacecraft? Now, why would one want to do this? Well, first and foremost, it's about this cost. But it's more than that, and I'll explain. But as I mentioned, local satellites, about 10 million. The cheapest NASA satellite ever was about eight, um, the most expensive being many, many billions. And when you look at a phone and the capabilities that it has, if you look at the overlap between that and a, a satellite, it's got most of it. So it's got a processor, obviously. It's got uh, accelerometers and rate gyros and magnetometers, all of which are good for attitude control. It's got GPS. It's got radios to communicate with. It's in a small, robust form factor that will probably survive high G loads. It all seems really great. And, and importantly, it only costs a few hundred dollars. And even though when you put something like this size, say about a kilogram, if you add a few other bits that it needs, um, into space, uh, that will cost about fifty uh, to seventy thousand dollars for the luxury of going on a rocket. Still, having a satellite that costs uh, say seventy thousand dollars or eighty thousand dollars is several orders of magnitude, about a factor of a hundred times cheaper than the cheapest satellite NASA has ever done. And so the question is, could there be a, 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 a set of applications for really low-cost satellites? So that's what we set about to explore, test the hypothesis, can this work in space? And then what would be the applications of satellites that cost vastly lower than typical satellites? And here I've just listed those things of what a satellite has and what the smartphone has. And there's only a few things we need to add. Most importantly, solar arrays to keep it powered. <laughs> So um, this is a rough layout. We're just adding, we, we're taking the Nexus 1 phone. We're adding a, a brighter radio and some batteries. And we're stuffing it in a little box. We're using the Android uh, uh, operating system. We're using a Nexus 1. That was the best phone on the, on the market at the time that we were trying to do this uh, at first, which was about a year ago. We have some help from um, some Google folks. And it's an open source project, both hardware and software we're open sourcing which is quite an interesting uh, um, step for NASA. Um, so the first thing, of course, is, is it actually going to work in a vacuum? Is it going to work and survive the G-loads? Is it going to work in the, under the radiation levels in space? So we went about and tested that. We sh the first thing, we shoved it in a vacuum chamber and set it to be emailing us all the data from all the different sensors. No problem. We raised and lowered the temperature like it was being heated in low Earth orbit. No problem. We shook it, shook, it, shook, it, shook it on a vibration table that is set up uh, to, to simulate the launch G-loads. Um, it, it gives it about 15 Gs RMS plus uh, there's another facility just outside this picture which gives it shock loads of a couple of hundred Gs, uh, what happens when the t rocket stages separate. We put it on a suborbital rocket. Um, we did two flights. One was meant to go to 70 kilometers, but failed. I'll show you some pictures. And this is what, what, what happened when it failed. The launch vehicle was meant to go to 70 kilometers. The upper stage separated from the lower stage um, uh, 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 and uh, uh, prematurely yanking out the parachute when it was going Mach 4 upwards, which was a bad time <laughs> for that to happen. The parachute yanked off. The whole upper stage came uh, tumbling down at terminal velocity into the sand of the desert out in Nevada. Everything was smashed. The rocket was pummeled into the ground. The, 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 the payload section, which was about a meter by about this wide, 
was, was now about 10 centimeters tall, a little disc. And to add insult to injury, all of it had landed on top of the foam because the foam was in the nose cone. <laughs> Everything was broken. We took this phone out. The screen was smashed, as you can see, but it still worked. And the SD card we took out, and it had all of our data. It was the only thing that survived. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> so it's re remarkably robust. And we don't need it to go undergo 10,000 Gs. So, so we, we've more than exceeded that. The second flight went very successfully. It went up to nine kilometers. And I have a little video here. Um, oops. Sorry, I didn't mean to go that back. Could you play the video, please? Just press click on somewhere. No, back one, sorry. OK, that one. Does it go? No, the video's not going. OK, whoosh, uh, rocket launches. <laughs> and uh, it's cool. Next video, then. Next slide. Oh, it was going to go there. Just, it was, it was OK. Any of the videos, <laughs> any of them, this one's fine. Then we send it on a balloon. Actually, we worked with the Google guys to send it on a balloon. And they put together this little video. Because um, they bit written this tracking app for tracking balloon uh, launches with Android. And uh, so we, we sh <laughs> yeah, this is their marketing. Um, so we, we launched this little cube. It went up to 10, uh, sorry, 100,000 feet, uh, which is 30, th 30 kilometers in normal units. This for us was more like an operational test, getting ready for the launch. If you hear that radio noise just at the end, that was the radio beeping. And um, what that is is, uh, so we're sending radio packets over the amateur band. We're not building a ground station. We haven't got the money in this. Na we're trying to keep everything under $10,000, absolute maximum, for the satellite, uh, except, apart from the launch bit that I mentioned cost about fifty or $70,000. Um, but the, we, we haven't got enough money to build a ground station, so what are we doing? We, we're, we're beaconing over the amateur radio band, and then we're emailing out the, the orbit and the, uh, the frequency and the protocol to the amateur radio community around the world who we're going to ask to email us back the, resu uh, the, the data. And so and we're launching three of them in December. Uh, 23rd of December is our launch. Uh, it's going to a very low altitude. Uh, we launched three of them just for redundancy, um, which cost us about 250k, 70 times three-ish. Um, and they're only lasting about three weeks before they come down because of atmospheric drag. Um, we're launching what we call PhoneSat 2.0 in, um, in the June uh, uh, time frame next year. And, and PhoneSat 2.0 is a little bit more sophisticated. Um, I'll show you what. So the first one is just literally going to try and take a picture and send it to the ground. That's, that's all it's going to do. And it's going to do it over these amateur radio packets. Um, and, and this is what it looks like. Uh, the, the, the metal box on the left, uh, it contains the phone and some extra batteries and the slightly brighter radio, as well as a little circuit that checks whether the phone's doing what it's doing. And if it's not, it reboots it. And this box is a 10 by 10 by 10 centimeter cube, which is a standard uh, 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 basically form factor for launching small secondary payloads on launch vehicles so that we can accommodate it on various different launches. Um, but it's essentially literally the Nexus phone stuck in there diagonally. It was partly a psychological battle here. Of course, we don't need the screen and a lot of the plastic casing. but. Um, we, we take it round to NASA people and say, look, a satellite can be this simple. In fact, it's really just the phone plus a few batteries. And, and it really does work, and it's passed all the standard NASA testing. But our phone set 2.0, because we're trying to iterate like the Silicon Valley uh, style, um, 
and PhoneSet 2.0 has a lot more capability. It also has solar arrays. It has two methods of attitude control. So reaction wheels and magnet talkers. So magnet talkers are just coils of copper wire that you can uh, uh, put a current through to react against the Earth's B field um, in order to change your orientation. One of the key things about this, um, though, is that already this phone is, will be the fastest processor ever governing a satellite put in space. And, and we were thinking, this is crazy. But this is because of the conservative nature of the space sector. So the, the last uh, mission that went to Mars uh, just very recently, Phoenix, um, took a 33 megahertz processor. And, and it's because the space industry wants to do exactly uh, use the hardware that it's used before and that they know works in space. So the revolution here is just taking the latest stuff and, and, and trying it in space and, and, and leveraging the, the, the great investments that are going on to miniaturizing this great technology into small little devices. Um, and so this has no attitude control. It's just going to be tumbling around. So how are we going to get a picture of the Earth back, which is our requirement? Well, we're going to take lots of pictures, and then we're going to, we're going to do a little uh, we've got a little image uh, uh, algorithm that, that checks which ones of the Earth in focus has some green pixels, and it will rank them by this, this algorithm, and then compress, uh, you know, take the top one, compress it, and start sending it out over the radio. So we're sort of compensating for a lack of capability with more, with more uh, processing power. So um, what, if these things cost that little, well, we can do a vast array of science missions. Maybe even we can do personal satellites. We, we think this opens up a huge array of possibilities for the space sector, and we're intending on exploring a great deal of them. I'd just leave you with a last and final thought, uh, which is what if space becomes more like a software domain, where the iteration timescales of this technology is dominated by us developing new apps, and, uh, and when we have a new idea for how we can use these satellites in space, we send this app up and try it in space so we can leverage a faster development time scale uh, by just uploading new apps into the satellite. Um, so if anyone has questions, and we put our software repos repository sort of alpha release there. Um, if anyone's interested in working with us uh, for this, towards this launch, we, are, uh, we have job, job opportunities. OK, thank you. <laughs>